So this is kind of, I think everybody probably has a, has a stories, and, and I'm going to end with one more story because it, it's a story about, uh, includes Peter's name. Many of you know that I am partners in a boat with Peter down in Naples. <laughs> Myself, Peter, Pat O'Brien, and Jim Shepard, who's over there. We went in and bought a boat, a very nice uh, deck boat, okay? So in order, to, how are we going to do this when there's four guys owning the boat? So Cliff Angers, who's also here, who's had much experience in owning boats, said, here's what you do. You, you get a formula amongst you four owners, and you then divvy up the cost of the boat and all the expenses of the boat on this formula basis. So the formula was how many months you were in Naples. I was there four months. Uh, uh, Peter was there four months. O'Brien was there five months. And Shepard was there all the time. So the formula carried out to four decimal places was I owned 426 of the boat. Uh, Peter owed 426, to Ryan owed 526, and whatever adds up. Shepard owned 1226, or whatever it was. So we have a meeting, and we lay this on Peter that we're going to share on this basis. He said, Well, that's okay for the normal expenses. But he said, Whoever is driving the boat, if he causes any damage to the boat that is not being shared by that formula, that person who causes the damage will bear all the expense himself. Now see, Peter thought he was a boatman because he lived on Whittier in Gross Point and he could actually see Lake St. Clair. To the best of my knowledge, he was never on St. St. Clair, but he features himself a seaman, okay? So, pretty much the first time we have the boat out, Peter insists on driving the boat. He was then, in, he was then at the beginning and at the end not a very good boat driver in my opinion. <laughs> The first time out under what we called the Jason rule, we called it the Jason rule, he ran into a piling and put a big dent in the boat. Okay? So, so under the Jason rule, he bore the entire expense of fixing the boat, not, not for 26 of it or whatever it was. Um, uh, so, so we thought he got a little bit of his comeuppance. Uh, where's Shepard? Did he ever get any better at driving the boat, in your opinion? Never. Never. No, not. <laughs> We miss Papa very much. He was such a great person. He was very sweet to everyone. We miss him. We all miss him. He was nice to everyone. He, he did what we asked. We all want him back. We all love him very much. And we will always remember him. We want him to know that he was very nice and very sweet. <laughs> he always played cards with us, and he would pl play hand and foot with our whole family. We loved Papa very much. I wish he was still alive so we could still do fun stuff with him. We all loved him. We all loved helping him up to the stair up the stairs and on the on our boat we will say thank you for all the people for coming well uh i have a couple of things and i'm going way back and some of you people will uh, know it and some of you won't uh, there's four or five of us here i know matt murphy and and pat conway myself and uh uh terry yeah we we uh uh we all uh started with Peter 62 years ago, 1955. And I was in classes with him a lot, so was Merv. And uh, I, to me, that's really a lifelong friend. Uh, I mean, if you go back 62 years. So that was uh, terrific. And uh, I, uh, I have a, a couple of things I wanted to mention. And one, I'm going to go back to high school, and some of you will remember this. <clears throat> but Peter was our drum major. And everything, if you remember, I mean, he was, a, you saw Moose say, saying how he walked. Well, he didn't prance real well. But he had this big, tall, white hat with this big, big feathery bow on it that he claimed all the time. He could lean over backwards and touch that. He has claimed that until the day he passed away. However, nobody has ever seen that. Nobody. So it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was really interesting. Then uh, down at Notre Dame, there's a couple of things that I, uh, 
uh, I wanted to bring up uh, uh, the uh, Pete and I for four years. Oh, something. When we started at Notre Dame, now our dads paid for our room, board, and tuition. We had to pay for everything else. So Peter and I had to work. But just to give you an idea what's happened, it was $975 a semester for room, board, and tuition. We had to pay for books and the other. So that's all your food and everything. Do you think things have gone a little wacky in college? Um, well, anyway, Pete and I worked in the dining hall for four years. And when you worked in the dining hall, you had a shed. And in the shed, you would have five guys. Two guys did trays. So when you did trays, what you would do is you would go out and pick up all the trays. You'd stack glasses to put them on top of each other. And then you would bring them back to the shed. And then you had a glass guy. And the glass guy would take all those glasses and empty them. And they were either milk or water. There was no pop, no lemonade, nothing like that. Milk or water, that was it. So the glasses guy did that. Then there were two guys, and they were sloppers. And the slopper took all the plates and got banged up against the and put all this garbage in these buckets. Well, Peter always did that. Now, we wore aprons all the time, and Peter's shoes were full of garbage. He wore the same shoes for four years. Now, when we went to school, they didn't have air conditioning in, in the classrooms. So in the fall and in the spring, what they would do is open the windows so we got a little ventilation. Every fly in South Bend <laughs> would land. People wouldn't sit next to Peter because the flies. <laughs> well, anyway, after four years of this, and I, I think it was you, Mickey, took Peter's shoes and threw them in the lake. <laughs> Just, uh, okay, the last of the three blind mice and I show, brevity being the soul of wit, under five minutes, promise. Uh, Peter got me my job at uh, Cooley by saying, hey, Ernie, when your clerkship's up, what are you going to do? I thought, I better start thinking about that. Well, come on down to Cooley. Why don't you see if Tom, uh, Tom Brennan and Bob Cranock uh, gave me the benefit of the doubt. I was hired in January of 1977, and I had 37 wonderful years at Cooley Law School. I'm so indebted to you, Judge Brennan. Golf trips. Before he moved to Naples, we were always partners driving to our destination. And honest to gosh, I thought I had, as a passenger, talking to some cross between the Pope and the Dalai Lama. And I, every time we'd finish, I'd say, you know, Peter, I've learned so much, I feel like I owe you money. I've had one-on-one -on -one FaceTime, and as <coughs> Pat O'Brien said, you don't, you learn an awful lot. Uh, the other thing is, Nancy Totsky sent a letter. I'm going to read you just an excerpt. It won't be long, but it was so sincere, and they go back since 1978, if you indulge me. Working with a man like Peter since 1978 in several secretarial capacities has given me a lifelong friendship and respect. I'm going to miss that a lot. He was a man of few words, which we all know, uh, but those words rang loud and clear to any and all who would listen. Peter always made me feel like I was doing a great job. He was so appreciative of what I could do to help him, and that alone made for a good working relationship. One of the perks of working with Peter is I got to know his many childhood and golf friends, and they too have become like a younger brother to me. I watched your kids grow up, graduate, get married, have kids, etc. He always made me feel like family, I could write a book about the many laughs we had working together at Cooley. Those memories will keep me smiling until I take my last breath. Hi, good evening. It's so great to be here. Uh, I go back like Patrick uh, O'Brien said, uh, Pete and I met in freshman year in high school well over 60 years ago and over the years a very, very dear friend. My wife Terry and I, we came up from Savannah, Georgia. That's where we live, we retired down there. Came up and ran over to Chicago and then of course headed over. And, it's been a beautiful day and I'm just so happy and everything that we were here. Real quick, I got two cute stories on Peter that I have to tell you. Number one, junior year we were at Notre Dame in Dillon Hall and Peter was semi-dating somebody back in Detroit, forget who it was, and he was really down, he was really depressed. He wasn't hearing from her, they were breaking up or whatever and things like this. So we felt sorry for Peter, we really and truthfully did, so we tried to put our heads together and we go into his desk drawer 
and see some old letters in there from this girl. Grab one out, put a little tape on the back, put it in the envelope in the, in where the mail came in. Peter goes the next day in there and he grabs the letter and he comes into the room shaking it like this, having fun, laughing, and we were all sitting in the room happy for him and everything like that. And he turns it over to open. Somebody open this letter! Somebody open this! And all of a sudden he found out he was so mad. <laughs> but we tried to, you know, get him a little bit on the positive that time. But the final story, um, it's sort of a cute story, but a true story, and something that my wife and I take great honor in, because we were the ones that introduced Pete and Sandy. And I gotta tell you the story, how this happened. Terry and I were just married in Detroit, and we were living in a place called Cardinal Court Apartments in Royal Oak. And all of a sudden, one day, we go down to the swimming pool, and who do we see down there? This gorgeous girl sitting down there. We went over and decided to introduce ourselves, you know, get to know the neighbors and everything like that. We got to know Sandy, and I went back, and I was thinking, you know, we gotta fix Sandy up with somebody. So the first one that came to mind was Peter. So I called Peter, and Peter said, come on out. We fixed him up. They went out on the first date, and Sandy, I don't know if you're gonna agree with me on this or not, but I have to say, after talking to Sandy the next day, she was not totally infatuated. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get her over the top on the first date, but I'll tell you, after date two, after date four, after date six, obviously we all know one of the happiest endings that we ever put together, and Terry and I take great, great pride in doing that. I mean it sincerely. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I'm Laura LaDuke, for those of you who don't know me, but many of those of you who do know me know me because I work here, and that you know that Don LaDuke is my dad, and that Cooley is my family. It has been my family since 1975, and Pete Jason was a big part of that Cooley family and our personal lives because Cooley was the other half of our family. Um, Judge Brennan, you may have been the architect of Cooley Law School, but Pete Jason and Larry and Ernie and Bill Weiner and Joe Kimball and Ann Wing and Bob Krynock and Phil Pergoski and Bob Fisher, they were the builders and this is the house that Pete built. Um, and like I said, it was my second family, and it was also Molly's and Andy's and Nick's. It's been a part of our lives since I was barely out of kindergarten, and I don't think Nick was even born. We watched our dad's stuff boxes, legal boxes, into the back of the station wagon when we went on family vacations so that they could grade their exams while we were on family vacation. Um, sometimes they would give us spelling tests from the misspelled words on the law school examinations. We watched uh, Ipsy Dixit softball games. We saw the camaraderie that was part of those early years of WMU Cooley and of which Pete was so big a part. We heard hilarious stories, some of them you've heard tonight about the golf trips. Um, I also remember one specific story where they were all on a golf trip talking about these feats that they all wanted to achieve, you know, before they died. And I'll never forget Pete's. It was that he wanted to go into the Iron Cross on the still rings and hold it for 30 seconds. <laughs> that was his main thing that he wanted to achieve. But make no mistake. At least one of their greatest achievements and Pete's greatest achievements is this building and this family that you're sitting amongst right now. Um, my dad couldn't be here today. He's down in Savannah and he's a very private person and he probably wouldn't like me to say this, but he is grieving the loss of his friend and fellow builder of this house. And, and uh, I, I can't think of a better legacy for Pete Jason than looking around this room today and seeing how many lives that he has touched. So, thank you. I was talking to a couple of my boys um, about Peter in the last couple of days, and I think maybe to show you what kind of an effect Pete had on people 
but also on boys who, when we did these trips, were 10 years old, roughly, and you know, they continued for a while, so we give, give or take a little bit. And we're talking 40 years ago, roughly. One of my sons, Matt, texted me this morning, and I'm going to edit this a little bit because it gets fairly long, but uh, he says, here's more of what I've been thinking about with Pete, in case it's helpful. Pete and our canoe trips have had a profound and profoundly positive impact on my life. I've climbed dozens of mountains with my brother and backpacked throughout California and the Pacific Northwest. I got a bike tour through France. I ran 250 miles through Ethiopia. Spent countless hours with my kids in the woods and on rivers, backpacking, canoeing, and fishing. All of that, which is core to who I am, and even what I believe, comes directly from those canoe trips and Pete Jason. And he said, and I hope I can get through this part of it, one more thing, and probably most important, is those trips played such an important role in the development of my extraordinary relationships with Tom and myself. I truly believe that those trips are foundational to mine and Tom's relationship, but also to mine and yours, I mean, myself. So this is what these trips meant to a man who's now 49 years old, uh, as he thinks back about Pete Jason, and I think a lot of us know that Pete had that kind of an influence, not only in kids, but on a lot of us as we've lived our lives. And say thank you to Pete for the many years of friendship. Thank you to Sandy and your children for the many years of friendship and uh, for sharing Pete with so many of us. To, I talked to Peter today at the, at the coffin. I told him he, he's got to bring us a victory tonight. I also, I thanked him for everything, for all the advice he's given me in my life. He, there were, there were incidents where I would get in trouble, and, he, and like Pat, I would talk to him, and he would, you know, tell me and tell me to, you know, this or that, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I told him I loved him very much, and uh, I really, really, truly miss him. Sandy, you, you were very fortunate to have him. He's a great guy, and as all of us here, we loved him. Thank you. I, I like to say a couple of words about Pete. I'm not a high school friend. <laughs> I'm not a college friend. Uh, but my office was right next door to Pete's for 18 years. And, my, and I apologize. My name is uh, Mabel Martin Scott. Uh, and Pete, uh, the first day I was hired, um, I, Pete's office was right next to mine. And as that week was going on, students were in and out of my office. And so Pete walks over uh, to me and he said, are, are you doing drugs in here or what? <laughs> and, and as everyone was saying, his wit was like, he had very dry. Uh, uh, no, said, no I'm not. He said, uh, what are all these students coming in out of here? And he said, they answer their own questions. Uh, you're not here to answer their question. That was his first uh, comment to me. And again, we were, I became the chair of the department. I, I've been at Cooley for 19 years. And I'm one of the last uh, professors that President Brennan hired. Uh, and it has been a fantastic uh, experience. Uh, he, his door was right next door to mine. And he, his office, his door was always open. And as people would come in when I became the department chair, uh, he would they'd come in and talk. And then he'd come in. He said, now, you know you don't believe anything that guy said. Uh, that isn't anything. And so he was always, um, he was always there uh, and always had advice. And we became uh, very good friends. I, I love Pete. Uh, one, of the last, one of the last conversations we had uh, is during the summers, he would come back. Uh, and so I had to sign teaching duties to, to, to our faculty in the contracts department. And so Pete would come in and he'd say, Mabel, whatever you give me, uh, I will do. And he always did that. And so he picked up a section of mine uh, one summer. And when I came back, I got him a gift certificate um, for doing so. And he was always so helpful in that regard. And so I went to his office to hand it to him. And he said, don't want him involved in any kind of controversy. He said, no. Uh, he said, hopefully. Uh, don't try to blackmail me in terms of doing it. I said, well, no. I said, Pete, it's, um, it's just a uh, thank you for having done that. And he said, okay. He said, I, no, thank you. He said, but I do have a request. 
And I said, okay. He said, okay, now you got to agree to it. I said, okay. He said, uh, when I go into the nursing home, I want you to come and clip my toenails. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I said, you, you sure you won't take this gift certificate that I have? He said, no. He said, I want you to promise uh, when I go to the nursing home uh, that you will come and clip my toenails. And so I thought about it, and I said, I, I would. And I absolutely wish I would have had an opportunity to do that. <laughs> uh, but I love him. He's a great guy. Thank you. Pete Jason was a law professor's law professor. With a twinkle in his eye, he could espouse the most preposterous position on any proposition of law or politics and stubbornly defend it against any and, any, any and every effort to uphold reason and common sense. He could make you think. He could make you analyze. He was a born teacher who motivated his students to work and forced them to learn how to learn. <coughs> I hired Pete Jason more than 40 years ago. No search committee, no formal application or interview. He was a friend of Bob Carnox, that U of D guy and at a relatively young age had already risen to the position of corporate counsel for the city of Detroit. He had no academic credentials, as I remember, but like most of the early faculty at Thomas Cooley Law School, Pete Jason was a good old boy. Well liked, well recommended, easy to know, fun to be with. Peter was the quintessen quintessential pixie he could draw you into a heated debate uh, with some outlandish assertion or improbable contention. You knew he wasn't serious, but he'd never admit to a spoof or concede a point. Looking back, I marvel at the chutzpah we all shared in the salad days of Cooley. In many respects, Pete Jason and I, along with a handful of others, shared the risk of making something out of nothing. That is an experience like no other. The act of creating, of founding, of launching an institution is not shared by many people. I know how iffy it was for me, a young married man with a young family, it was certainly as shaky a limb for Peter Jason and his wife Sandy as well. But it was a limb he happily crawled out on. Nobody was more dedicated or committed to the Thomas M. Cooley Law School than was Peter D. Jason. And no one is to this day more nearly identified with Cooley and its philosophy of access to legal education. P. Jason is dead. He died just a week or so ago and not much longer than a few days after uh, he sat next to Polly and me at a dinner with some of the faculty folks up in Harbor Springs. It's a strange reality. One moment you are enjoying the company of an old and dear friend, laughing at stories told and retold over the years, then seemingly in the blink of an eye, the friend is gone. The companionship, so real and vital, is over. The present has become the past. The friend has lost his own time and space. And now he lives only in the shared memories of those who knew and loved him. Polly and I, along with all the folks at Cooley Law School and a virtual army of his former students, will keep him in our, keep him in our hearts and prayers. 